and Costello is getting testier and testier. And he says, you know, geez, into the mic. And he says, what is going on here? And Mershon is like, what did you say? And Costello says, I shit you not, strike it. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> you do not, as a lawyer in a courtroom, start issuing rulings from counsel, from the from the witness stand, let alone from Yeah, he's not a lawyer. He's a witness. No. Yeah. Welcome to Law and Chaos. Today, we'll have a deep dive into the recent Supreme Court decision upholding the CFPB, a victory for both Senator Elizabeth Warren and for consumers. And then we'll cover a wild day in New York as Trump's false business records case speeds toward its inevitable conclusion. And for subscribers, we'll catch up with Trump's concierge judge, Eileen Cannon, in the Southern District of Florida. We got a lot to cover, so let's get after it. Hey guys, I'm Liz I. With me is Andrew Torres. And uh, wow, today was an exciting day for court watchers. <laughs> yes, it was. But you're also being modest because you put all of our listeners on Costello Watch in our last episode, episode 30. And, you know, we've wondered, but I uh, guess I'm glad we now have our answer. And I'm glad that Trump's legal team apparently does not listen to this podcast because they set up Robert Costello as basically their only defense witness. And uh, that appears to have backfired in hilarious fashion. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that Costello Watch is going to be like the newest hit on CBS. Um, <laughs> I, although I enjoyed watching it. I, w- I would watch Costello Watch for at least a couple of hours. <laughs> there, there are worse reality shows. So. Right. OK, so just before we get to the show, we're going to thank our supporters because it is Monday and that is what we do. And we appreciate you. So from Substack, thank you to Sean, Amanda, Chris Learned, Optimus Prm, I don't know what that is, but I appreciate you. Uh, Desha Ordo, Paul Sackert, John, Jeremy, Baileys, M.M. Stone, Ingrid, Trucker39, and EGM. And on Patreon, a big thanks to Cal, Tana, Joe, Ted, Andy the Dandy, Tom, Whitey Tight T. Fitton. I would love it if Tom Fitton was the show. Tanner, I feel like he's not. David. Gretchen, Mr. Me, Xander, Marianne, Peter, Greg Frostrom, LD19 Arizona House Candidate. Yeah, welcome back, Greg. Richard, Eric, Kindlebrin, M. Zabados, Julia, LB Shreve, Harold, Kate, JMW, Tim, Thomas, Bill, and Tom. And again, remember, if you support us either on Substack or patreon.com slash law and chaos pod, you get the shout out here, you get the free episodes, you get all the goodies that we have planned for you. So uh, if you can help us out, that is patreon.com slash law and chaos pod. Okay. So for our first story, Andrew, let's talk about the Supreme Court. Uh, Shadow docket, merits docket. How about we start with flags? (laughs) I knew knew you were going to be all over this. Yeah. So I I guess you guys have all seen this um, story about Sam Alito's wife flying the flag upside down because one of her neighbors was mean to her. You know, absolutely no part of that story hangs together, right? Like, look, the, the obvious inference is, Alito and his wife are either election deniers or because, look, they're not that stupid. Election denier sympathizers. They flew a flag upside down, which is the sign of election deniers. And, I, you know, I guess Clarence Thomas needed some company. I'm sorry. Did you say they're not that stupid? Chris Geidner, he was on the show a few weeks ago. He he mm-hmm. broke a story today about Alito selling his Budweiser stock after that whole, you know, the, the <laughs> I, I Anheuser-Busch like gave a, was nice to a trans lady one time and needed to be boycotted to teach it to. I mean, like he seems extremely red pilled and, I, you know, he's like a white guy and he's late. <laughs> I mean, he's kind of he's. Let's say he's in the red pill demographic. I, I, I definitely, you know, yeah, they're that fair. stupid. They're that. Have <laughs> you seen Jenny Thomas? They could definitely one thousand percent be that stupid. Certainly, Mrs. Alito could be that stupid. I just, <laughs> I guess, what I take away from this is that he thinks we're that stupid if he's trying to sell us a version of this story in which, like, he just didn't know was the flag upside down. He never noticed it, and he doesn't know. And and he and you know, his wife, poor, poor. Poor Mrs. Alito with the neighbors being so mean to her. Yeah. And look, all we can do is continue to call this out, draw attention to it. That's absolute nonsense. But okay. So 
As we teased on Friday, the Supreme Court issued two significant decisions last week, including a shadow docket decision that's good news, right, at least in the short term, for the Mm -hmm. voters of Louisiana and for, you know, those of us who'd like to see the Democrats retake the House of Representatives in the fall. Uh, But, uh, yeah. So let's start with the merits decision. That is Consumer Financial Protection Bureau versus Community Financial Services Association of America. That was a 7-2 decision on the merits in which the Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of how the CFPB is funded. So I wrote a column about this for our Substack over at Law and Cast pod.com in which I really got into the weeds about how this interacts with the fifth circuit. It was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it was fun to read. You guys should all definitely check it out. But irrespective of whether this is, you know, a shot across the bow of the fifth circuit or not, this is a really important case about controlling the power of, you know, scumbag predatory lenders. Right. So 62% of the people in this country live paycheck to paycheck, which means they don't have cash for an unexpected expense. So a recent bank rate survey indicated that fewer than half of us, that is all of us Americans, have $1,000 lying around in case something goes wrong. And you look, stuff goes wrong, right? We all have flat tires. We all have broken hot water heaters or air conditioners or leaking roofs or broken windows. Like That's a basic fact of life for everybody. It isn't whether it will happen. It is when it will happen. Yeah. And so you've got a significant chunk of the population that can't afford immediate short-term expenses. And by the early 90s, you have a decade plus of banking deregulation. So, you know, you get your greedy chocolate in my deregulated (laughs) peanut butter and you come up with payday lending. I mean, it's just like just as good as like when you have Dish soap and Vegemite together is my favorite sandwich spread. (laughs) It's a dessert topping and a floor wax. But look, okay, so the premise, right, how payday lending is supposed to work, this is how it was pitched to states as a good thing, was itself kind of wildly oppressive, right? So lenders give you a short-term advance of, say, $500 on your next paycheck. And then you typically have to pay the lender back $30 in fees for every $100 you borrow. Right. So Mm -hmm. meaning, you know, 650 bucks on that $500 loan when your paycheck comes in. Right. That amounts to, by the way, 782 percent in interest, which is, you know, 30 times higher than most states maximum rate of interest. Right. And so the payday lenders pitching this plan lobbied for and got explicit exemptions from state usury laws. Right. Just just to be clear, that's annualized interest. Right. It's not Mm -hmm. not seven. You know, our math isn't that bad. (laughs) (laughs) so those are the two fundamental features of payday lending right extremely short loan terms the average of which is two weeks right and usurious rates of interest right so put a pin in that for now and look that's pretty much the best case scenario for payday lending right in practice it's proven to be so much worse Mm -hmm. right because People living paycheck to paycheck generally can't afford to pay, you know, their rent and buy groceries and keep the power on and also fork over that extra 500 bucks and also fork over those usurious interest payments and everything else by the time their next paycheck clears. So after two weeks, the statistics show 80% of payday loan borrowers re-borrow in order to make that first loan payment. But now you're borrowing $650 and at Right. And so on. So you get trapped in the cycle where consumers are paying back thousands of dollars while making no progress on the principle of what was initially a couple hundred dollars. Um, That's pretty bad. Right. And it gets worse because, you know, the people who loan you 500 bucks at, you know, 782 percent interest probably don't satisfy themselves with, you know, pretty please pay back the amounts that you borrowed. No, they've used a bunch of oppressive tactics. I mean, basically, They basically did everything shy of trying to break legs, right? Mm -hmm. So one of those things was requiring applicants to link their bank accounts. And then if you missed two payments on your payment plan, they would automatically deduct from your bank account without checking the balance, right? From people who had to get a payday loan in the first place. So now you've got to pay back the overdraft fees on your, right? Like it's just horrible. So I already used the Reese's peanut butter cup joke, but but look, like all of this terrible greed by payday lenders was happening 
you know, around the same time that the subprime mortgage crisis kicked in and wrecked mm-hmm. the economy. And you know, so generally you had a, a consensus that, hey, maybe three decades of Republican deregulation of the financial sector wasn't such a great idea after all. So, you know, we elected Barack Obama and in 2010, with Democrats in control of the White House and both houses of Congress, they passed comprehensive reform. That was the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. And, you know, the effort was to, I don't know, try and try and hold back some of the worst damage. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the components of, of Dodd-Frank was 12 USC Section 5481 at SEC. And that created the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. That's the brainchild of Senator Elizabeth Warren, as you teased in our intro, right? And the the CFPB's job, broadly speaking, is to protect consumers from unfair, deceptive, or abusive acts and practices by lenders, right? So Mm -hmm. as Senator Warren put it, the CFPB was meant to be, quote, a cop on the beat to enforce the laws on credit cards, mortgages, student loans, prepaid cards, and other kinds of financial products and services. Which is great. Uh, But the problem with passing a law is that Republicans sometimes win back the White House and Congress, and then they wreck everything you already built. Uh, Obviously, that is the first thing that the Republican Congress did when Trump got elected, was to reduce the Obamacare tax penalty for noncompliance to zero in hopes that they Mm -hmm. would spark a death spiral and and, and end the Affordable Care Act. And even if Republicans don't win back control of Congress, a Republican president can appoint heads of agencies to wreck those agencies they've been appointing to lead, like naming Betsy DeVos, who spent her entire adult life trying to destroy the public school system in Michigan as Secretary of Education, or naming Rick Perry, who can't count to three, as the Secretary of Energy, or, uh, hey, spoiler alert, naming Mick Mulvaney, founder of the House Freedom Caucus, as head of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau so he could request that the agency have a budget of zero. That that seems like not enough. Okay, right. So to protect against those kinds of easily anticipated shenanigans, the original Dodd-Frank bill creating the CFPB had two features designed to protect against it, right? And yeah, the operative word there is had, that that's also a bit of foreshadowing, right? So mm-hmm. first, Congress tried to insulate the director of the CFPB from being Mulvaney, right? Section 5491B specified that the director would be appointed by the president with the advice and consent of the Senate, right? And would serve a five-year term, right? And then Subsection C instructed that the president could only remove that director for cause, which was defined in the statute as inefficiency, neglect of duty, or malfeasance in office, right? Not just, I'd like you not to do your job. So look, even if the country lost its collective damn mind and elected a criminally insane game show host as president, the CFPB director would would be safe for at least that first year. Okay, that's feature one. The second feature by which Congress tried to protect the CFPB from being a political football, right, was by giving it an alternate source of funding as compared to most executive branch agencies, right? So typically, if you're an executive branch agency, what you you have to do is beg Congress every year for appropriations in the omnibus budget bill. Instead, pursuant to 12 U.S.C. Section 5497, the CFPB can just file a requisition with the Federal Reserve for, and here's what the statute says, the amount determined by the director to be reasonably necessary to carry out its duties. And that is subject to a mandatory cap of 12% of the Federal Reserve System's total operating expenses. And that is 12% of the Federal Reserve System's total operating expenses as of the fiscal year 2009 as adjusted for inflation. So in 2022, when you do the math, you get $734 million as a cap. Right. So that is where we all were until Donald Trump got elected and everything went to shit. So we all agreed that the CFPB director could only be removed for cause and the CFPB was funded from the Fed, not the regular budget, which nobody on either side of the aisle thought was a problem. But then the CFPB started actually enacting regulations, which got in the way of payday lenders who remain major contributors to the Trump campaign and Republicans generally. In fact, the the annual payday lenders convention is at a Trump property. 
So in 2017, the CFPB promulgated a bunch of rules designed to protect consumers from predatory lenders, including the payday lenders rule, which, among other things, prohibited lenders from withdrawing funds from your bank account without your consent. Before Mick Mulvaney got his hands on it, that rule also required lenders not to loan to people who could not pay. Mm -hmm. But even in a diminished form, the rule was called a potential death sentence by the payday lending companies. So they teed up a bunch of lobby suits and they forum shopped for Trump appointees in obviously Texas, knowing that if they somehow lost at the district court level, they'd be able to appeal to the Fifth Circuit and get a very sympathetic hearing. Yep. And for more details on that, check out our column over at longcastpod.com. We talk about how this forum shopping and greed got so egregious that the payday lenders managed to piss off Trump appointee Mark Pittman, who's, you know, otherwise, again, not just a conservative judge, not just a Trump judge, but a Trumpy judge, right? But I have, I see you giving me the eye, so not I've already all. indulged my rabbit trailiness on that part. No, I was delighted. It was perfect. <laughs> okay. So look. Obviously, Republicans were not just going to let, you know, Democrats pass laws protecting the consumers and get away with it. So when Trump got into office, he simply announced that he was going to fire the CFPB director, Richard Cordray, and replace him with, Liz, your aforementioned foreshadowing, Mick Mulvaney, Uh despite, you know, the fact that the law said he couldn't do that. I mean, it it also said he couldn't name Jared Kushner chief, but, but I digress. Okay, look, that led to a bunch of lawsuits, and unfortunately... Trump appointee, uh, but not Trumpy judge, Tim Kelly of the U.S. District Court of the District of Columbia, refused to issue an injunction blocking Trump from firing Cordray. And then in a parallel case called Sela Law versus CFPB, again, I discuss it in depth in the piece, that wound its way from the Texas District Court to the Fifth Circuit to the Supreme Court. And Chief Justice Roberts authored the 5-4 opinion, that was back when Ruth Bader Ginsburg was still on the court, in which the court held that requiring the director right, to serve five years and only be removed for cause violated, I don't know, some nebulous concept of separation of powers, notwithstanding the fact that the CFPB statute was modeled after language used without controversy for the last hundred years with respect to the Federal Reserve Board, the Federal Trade Commission, the National Labor Relations Board, uh, among others. And and in fact, that, that spurred Elon Musk to sue the National Labor Relations Board, challenging its provisions. Yeah. So, so uh, thanks. Thanks, Chief Justice Roberts. Yeah, I'm just going to read a little bit from Justice Kagan's dissent, where she noted that if precedent were any guide, that provision would have survived its encounter with this court. And so would the intended independence of the CFPB. Our Constitution and history demand that result. The text of the Constitution allows these common for cause removal limits. Yeah, I, you know, you know, my grand unified theory of the Roberts Court is that in future years, it will be referred to alongside the Lochner Court and its epitaph will be, oh, yeah, this was the time in the Supreme Court's history where it inexplicably decided that precedent didn't count anymore. But screw uh, stare decisis. (laughs) Yes. So your point is well taken. In 2020, the Supreme Court broke one of the CFPB's legs because, you know, it was too effective at its job. So now future Republican presidents can fire the director at will and replace them with Rick Perry or Mick Mulvaney or Betsy DeVos or, you know, somebody trying to sabotage the bureau from the inside. Right. So that's one pillar of the CFPB's independence. But of course, the GOP wasn't satisfied with that. So around the same time as Saylor Law was winding its way through the courts, a lobbying group representing payday lenders was busy challenging that second provision, insulating the CFPB from having to beg Congress to fund it every year. Their argument was that the Constitution's Appropriations Clause requires Congress to only fund executive branches via a yearly appropriations process and not by any other means. Yeah, and that is to put it mildly, a very dumb argument, right? Like the Appropriations Clause, it's Article 1, Section 9, Clause 7. It says, no money shall be drawn from the Treasury, but in consequence of appropriations made by law. And a regular statement and account of the receipts and expenditures of all public money shall be published from time to time. So let's break that down. Congress passed the Federal Reserve Act in 1913. It created and funded the Federal Reserve by law. And then it passed the Dodd-Frank Act of 2010. It created and funded the CFPB by law, by any sane interpretation. That means Congress appropriated funds to the CFPB by law because, you know, we have 200 years of case law that says that the Appropriations Clause, and here I'm going to quote from the lower court's decision, quote, means simply that no money can be paid out of the Treasury unless it has been appropriated by an act of Congress, which this obviously was. 
Right. And that's more or less what the Supreme Court said in an opinion written by, wait for it, Justice Clarence Thomas. (laughs) I'm surprised too. (laughs) Based on the Constitution's text, the history against which that text was enacted, and congressional practice immediately following ratification, we conclude that appropriations need only identify a source of public funds and authorize the expenditure of those funds for designated purposes to satisfy the appropriations clause. Yeah. So look, this is a great result. It means that for now, the CFPB can continue doing its job, even if its director can get replaced if Trump wins in November. So uh, let's make that not happen. Yeah. Just before we leave this, I just want to disambiguate for a hot second here, because I I think maybe maybe some people didn't 100% follow this. Basically, the payday lenders argument was Congress has this big bucket of money and it hands it out to the agencies. And that's the only way it can go. But if one agency funds another agency and that's, you know, decreed by law, it violates the appropriations clause for the money to come first through the Federal Reserve and then to the CFPB. And that's like, that's just stupid. So which is <laughs> which is what the court said. And I think that this is going to have some kind of longer ramifications, which we we talked about a little bit in the piece, but that Republicans and conservatives generally have been via the Fifth Circuit attacking all of these agencies that have any kind of funding structure. And that that's what you alluded to about Musk attacking the National Labor Relations Board. So I think this is going to have some good knock on effects. I don't know that it will reign in the Fifth Circuit, but it's not it's not terrible. Yeah, I totally agree. All right. So let's talk briefly about the other decision from last week, which was from the shadow docket. It's Landry v. Calais. We infer that it is 6-3 with the liberals in dissent because the last line of the brief ordering the stay says that Justice Sotomayor and Justice Kagan would deny the application for stay Justice Jackson dissents. Uh, Usually that means that you and I like take a deep breath and wonder what fundamental right is going to be taken away from us next. But that is that is not the case here, is it? No, no, look, this is going to be a good thing for democracy in general and black representation in Louisiana in specific. So let me briefly unpack it, right? Here's what happened. After the 2000 census, all of the states, including Louisiana, had to redraw their congressional districts, right? That That's required by law. Louisiana's act was HB1. In 2022, A federal district court judge enjoined that new map, HB1, finding that it likely violated Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act because it created one of six congressional districts as a majority-minority district, and 32% of Louisiana is black. Right. So after a bunch of judicial wrangling, including, you know, in front of our favorite monsters at the Fifth Circuit, that led to a redrawn map in 2023 that was called SB8 that finally created two majority-minority districts out of six. And then that got enjoined by those aforesaid monsters at the Fifth Circuit. And if you're Patreon at any level, over at uh, patreon.com slash lawandchaospod, you'll get a deep dive on exactly what happened next. Uh, If not, you'll get a couple of ads and help us pay some bills, and we will see you on the other side. So ultimately, the wrangling over districts led the Republican Secretary of State of Louisiana, Nancy Landry, to ask the Supreme Court to please just let them use the SB8 map. Don't send them back to the drawing board for a third time, right? Which the Supreme Court did, but in my view, in the worst way possible, right? So so the minute order as way of justification, and again, remember the shadow docket, they don't have to explain it all. It just has one line. It says, C, Purcell versus Gonzalez, 549 US 1, 2006. And you may recall Purcell as the decision that allows a court to decline to order relief in an elections case, even if the plaintiffs are right, if, you know, it's too close to an election. So uh, I'm going to quote from a Brett Kavanaugh concurrence applying the Purcell doctrine. Filing deadlines need to be met. Candidates and voters need to know who will be running against whom. And state and local election officials need substantial time to plan for elections because running elections statewide is extraordinarily complicated and difficult. So, so look, it's not wrong, right? Like, you, you do need time to draw maps and administer elections and finalize it. But, but that assumes everybody's playing fair in the process. And that, that's a fact, not in evidence, right? So mm-hmm. 
I am very pleased that African Americans in Louisiana have something approaching actual representation in the House. I am also pleased, as a fan of the Democrats winning back the House, that they are likely to move one step closer to, to retaking the House of Representatives this fall. But I don't really love continuing to expand a doctrine that basically asks if Brett Kavanaugh or Sam Alito thinks it's too close to an election to change things in the pesky interest of democracy, right? Because look, House cycles are only two years long, right? This case moved about as fast as you possibly can do it. And and if six months, right, if if 25% of an election cycle is not enough time, like you basically can always get a free gerrymander, right? And then if you're sufficiently evil about it, you know, you just change the district again, right? After the election, moot the results, start back over again. I I should stop before I give Republican officials any more ideas. Right. And that's basically what Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson said in her dissent. She said, in my view, Purcell has no role to play here. There is little risk of voter confusion from a new map being imposed this far out from the November election. In fact, we have often denied stays of redistricting orders issued as close or closer to an election. And then she string cites all of these times when the court was happy to enjoin seats to advantage Republicans. She goes on, of course, administrative difficulties may occur if a new map is imposed late in an election cycle, but I would have let the district court's remedial process run its course before considering whether our emergency intervention was warranted. Yeah, and I think that's right, even though it's a good result. Yeah. Okay, we will be back after this brief ad break, unless you are a subscriber on Substack or a Patreon at patreon.com slash lawnchaospod, in which case you will get a bonus deep dive on everyone's least favorite judge, Eileen Cannon, Federalist Society weirdo, and you will get the show ad free. Okay. Now let's talk about what happened in New York today as Michael Cohen finished up his testimony against Donald Trump in the false business records case. Yeah. And look, I really don't like to armchair lawyers with much more trial experience than me. But like, why, why did they let Todd Blanche cross examine Michael Cohen? Right. Like when I searched through, like Blanche had one good punch on day three where, you know, he showed that Michael Cohen might have been complaining about a literal 14 year old trolling him on the Internet or something. Right. Like at the time when Cohen said he was actually talking to Donald Trump's bodyguard, Keith Schiller, about Stormy Daniels. Right? And, and, and OK, fine. Inconsistency. But even that got undone today. And, and then. I, 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 <laughs> yeah. All right. But then and then Robert Costello. But we jumped the gun. <laughs> the day began with Justice Mershon saying that issues came up over the weekend and the jurors will be released whenever testimony ends and recalled next week for closing arguments. That was that was at sidebar until, until the court releases the transcripts. We don't know exactly what those issues were, but like, all right, look, they were already probably going to be off for Wednesday because they're always off for Wednesday. It's a holiday weekend, so there's no Monday. You know, obviously Monday was Memorial Day. Then, you know, maybe Friday they have off. Maybe some juror said, I'm probably going to have influenza at the beach over the weekend. You know, you can see how <laughs> yeah. they were like, no, we're not starting closing arguments on Wednesday and then coming back on Tuesday, five days later. That's not that's yeah. not a thing. Anyway, after the conference was concluded, Trump had, you know, a dozen sycophant ass kissers like parade into the court, including Republican politicians and Kash Patel and Bernie Carrick and Boris finally indicted Epstein and bringing up for your Andrew. The vippiest of VIPs was your old professor, Alan Dershowitz. Uh, I, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, there's more. Th this is a tweet from Lawfare's Tyler O'Brien, an absolute must follow if you want to know what's going on in court. He says, as Dershowitz attempts to mingle with the hoi polloi in the gallery, a court officer walks over to him and Dersh asks, am I not allowed to talk? The guard shakes his head, no, to which Dersh exclaims, he was my student. There's a special exception for former students. <laughs> the court officer walks away. So Dershowitz, still standing in there, resumes chatting. Eventually, he wanders back to the Trump row and sits there by himself because the rest of the Trump team left with the former president. Uh, OK. All right. Fighting word. But if it's a fight you want, Liz, how about this? I'm pretty sure Donald Trump is not going to testify. <laughs> I, I said I was only 58 percent sure. And look, it's not <laughs> it's it's not done until the fat lady sings or doesn't say whatever. It doesn't matter. The point is that that Todd Blanche said basically that Costello was his final witness. Um, 
Woo. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm not, I mean, God, well, you and I talked about this and we'll talk about it in a minute, but God, that's not who I'd want as my final witness. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because in addition to Trump not testifying, neither is Trump's proposed election law expert, Bradley Smith, right? That was another motion in Lemonade decided, well, that reiterated uh, at the beginning session, right? Justice Mershon really cabined any potential testimony by Smith. He, he ruled that Smith may not testify as a lay fact witness. He may not offer opinion testimony regarding the interpretation or application of federal campaign finance laws and how they relate to the facts in the instant matter, nor can he offer or testify as to an opinion as to whether the alleged conduct in the case does or does not constitute a violation of the Federal Election Campaign Act. Right? So you might be thinking, what's left? Uh, Justice Mershon said, Smith will be permitted to testify generally as to the following general background as to what the Federal Campaign Commission is, background as to who makes up the FEC, what the FEC's function is, what laws, if any, the FEC is responsible for enforcing, and general definitions and terms that relate directly to this case, such as, for example, campaign contribution. Yeah, I, I can see why Trump was like, no, that's not going to work. So let's get to Cohen and Costello. We resume with the third day of cross-examination of Michael Cohen by Todd Blanche. Cohen was sleazy and flustered last week. He returned on Monday sleazy and calm. <laughs> Blanche was unfocused and flustered last week. He returned unfocused and calm, which is a long way of saying he just kind of meandered around for hours and the prosecutors gave up objecting because like if Blanche wants to waste time boring the jurors to death, they weren't going to like spice it up, you know, and get in his way and make it interesting again. Like, hey, go to sleep. We don't care. Yeah. And so remember, there were... Basically, three things that Trump's lawyers wanted to do, uh, wanted to get out of Michael Cohen on cross examination, right? So, the first is this is really the only prosecution witness that they've managed to lay a glove on at all, right? Like, they, they thought they were going to dirty up Stormy Daniels, uh, episode 28. I think you really did a masterful job of explaining, mm, kind of not. And, mm -hmm. and, and so, what that leaves are the two elements of the crime, right? Number two, were there false entries? And number three, did Donald Trump knowingly authorize those false entries in furtherance of covering up another crime? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's really only the second. The first appears to me to be a foregone conclusion. I, I know what you're going to say, right? They did try and pretend <laughs> today like, oh, Michael Cohen was doing real work. But I just, there's nobody in that. I mean, that's like the number of people who believe that Michael Cohen was doing real work or the number of people who believe that Stormy Daniels and Donald Trump did not have a sexual encounter is like functionally zero. And I'm sure that on the jury it's zero. And like, I don't even know why we're arguing about that. Like, obviously these were false entries. The real, the whole enchilada here is did Trump knowingly enter into these, into this deal, right? Was Trump a party to this transaction? Yeah. Uh, although I will tell you, right. Blanche spent several hours introducing testimony that Cohen did legal work in 2017 for Donald Trump and his family members. He talked about a case against Madame Tussaud's wax museum, right? He he introduced evidence that that Cohen had other kind of, you know, we might say loose arrangements with other clients like AT&T and Novartis, right? Like so the implication was, yeah, uh just cuz Cohen isn't getting paid like a normal lawyer, like that's he doesn't get paid like a normal lawyer. He just gets these kind of like wads of cash. He yeah, I, I just like to make that clear. The work that he did for AT&T and Novartis was essentially like hawking himself as a liaison to the president. And he, he was hiring himself as a lobbyist. He wasn't really working as a lawyer for those for those companies. So, you know, this this kind of a, attempt to make it analogize to a to a retainer agreement was stupid. I mean, I take your point, which you and I said off the air that like, look, Trump didn't have like specific job as a lawyer. His job was like to hang around and be the lawyer on call. And like if Madame Tussauds like had a wax figure of Melania smiling like a normal person to like, you know, go threaten them, like cut that shit out. But I, I mean, <laughs> I mean, what I'm saying is <laughs> that argument was so totally unconvincing, at least from the coverage. We haven't seen the transcripts yet, but I mean, nobody believes that shit. I, I wouldn't think so. And, and yeah, I, I would point out that Cohen had the arrangement that Republicans think Hunter Biden had with Burisma, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I would add the point you've made to me previously, which is in order to believe any of this, you have to disregard Alan Weisselberg writing gross up on right. the invoice. Right. Like, right. I, so that Cohen no, could get reimbursed for the tax liability, right? Yeah. Which is not how any of that shit works. 
you don't double a lawyer's bill so that they get more money after taxes if they're just if they're doing any kind of real work. So, yeah. Yeah. I thought that the really damaging own goal here was introducing testimony about Red Finch. We talked about this because it's just so goddamn funny. That was <laughs> the online poll, which Michael Cohen paid some IT guy from Liberty University to rig. So it would look like Trump was, you know, the choice of the people. And he promised the guy $50,000, but he didn't give him $50,000. He gave him the, the figure has been reported is like $12,000 or $20,000. It's not clear, but like not fifty thousand dollars he said in court that it was twenty thousand dollars in cash in a like grocery store bag um <laughs> and plus like a boxing glove or some shit like that anyway blanche got cohen to admit that he billed the trump organization or told told weisselberg that he had actually been out of pocket the whole fifty thousand dollars um and so he you know he got the extra thirty thousand dollars and the point of this was i guess to prove that cohen is a lying liar who lies which like who the hell is surprised by that by now? Like, good, <laughs> right. good, you proved that he's a liar. No shit. Cohen said that he felt justified stealing from Trump because they'd cut his bonus from the year before. And in his testimony, he said, like, I stole because they owed me. And that kind of contradicts that Cohen did this out of the goodness of his heart. That, that Right? Like, if your theory is that Cohen paid $130,000 to uh, in hush money because he had such deep abiding affection and respect for Donald Trump and also your theory is that he stole because you know he's a, a conniving schemer like those two things don't work together so we, we talked about the C-SPAN photo so there was a C there was a little argument there was a dispute because it was like a 116 second phone call and the prosecutors blanched the the one thing that he did right was kind of get cohen to admit that on this phone call he talked to schiller about a problem that he was having being harassed online and then they said you know, you know trump wasn't even in the room you didn't even talk to him about stormy daniels and confirm the payoff and he said yes i did yes i did and then the prosecutor said oh lucky us we found this picture from c-span that shows that schiller was standing right next to donald trump at the time that this phone call happened and so you know hey michael cohen did you talk to Donald Trump during this phone call. Are you sure? And Cohen was like, yes, ma'am, I did. So the end, right? And and the prosecutors did a really excellent job, including Susan Hoffinger. She, she did what she had to do at the end here, right? If the issue is, Michael Cohen, say that Donald Trump told you to do the thing that you did, right? So do you have any doubt in your mind that Trump gave you final sign-off? Answer, no doubt. Would you have paid Stormy Daniels $130,000 had Trump not signed off? No. But then, after yeah. that... <laughs> yeah, well, and that, and we should say, that ended the prosecution's case in chief, right? Which, right. again, good strategy, key witness, Excellent. they rested, they rehabilitated him from the only blow that the defense team had landed over three days of testimony split over a weekend. Really good trial strategy. Okay, but now... It's time for Robert Costello. <laughs> All right. Let me just give you a little background on Robert Costello because he's like freaking Zelig in Trump land. Robert Costello uh, <laughs> was a prosecutor who worked with Rudy Giuliani back when Rudy Giuliani ran the Southern District of New, New York. So like not recently. Uh, and I, I mean, he appears to have never gotten over it. So Costello, right, he, he's represented Steve Bannon. He's represented Rudy Giuliani. He sued both of these fine fellows for not paying the <laughs> bill. He helped Giuliani get the Hunter Biden laptop out. He's kind of an asshole. So he kind of worked in some kind of legal capacity with Michael Cohen in 2018 during the Mueller investigation when, when Michael Cohen was trying to decide was should he stay with Trump or should he flip on Trump? And it's been suggested that he, Costello, involved himself in a pardon dangle to, uh, to Cohen. I don't, I don't necessarily think that's what happened, but it's very clear that what he did was function as a go-between, talking mm -hmm. to Giuliani and conveying Cohen's messages to Trump and, you know, giving Cohen attaboys, theoretically, from Donald Trump to encourage Cohen to stay on side and not flip. Cohen had a whole squad of lawyers, and Costello clearly wasn't one of them, at least right. in not in not in the traditional sense. Right. Costello, after he stopped representing uh, Cohen in whatever capacity that he did, turned on Cohen. And so before Trump was going to be indicted, he had a chance to bring a, uh, a rebuttal witness in to speak to the grand jury. And he sent Costello to say, you know, Michael Cohen's a lying piece of shit, which like, yeah, newsflash, film at 11. And not only that, but Costello has been shit-talking Michael Cohen publicly ever since, including last week where he addressed 
Congress. It was Jim Jordan's dog and pony show. I think it was the weaponization of the federal government committee or whatever. It's all bullshit, right? Mm -hmm. It's all the I hate... I hate Joe Biden and Donald Trump is God committee. So Costello testified and said Cohen is a liar and D-A-N-Y has no case and this is all bullshit. And and to be fair, Dan Goldman, Representative Dan Goldman in that committee, read Costello for filth and said, look, if you have something to say, go say it in court. And uh, un- unbelievably, he actually did. <laughs> t- t- look, Dan Goldman is not giving Trump free legal advice there. So, you know, if you don't, maybe don't. T- so, OK, I would not. I am not a criminal defense attorney. I am gobsmacked that they decided to call Costello. I. I was terrified that they would call Alan Weisselberg and ask him to perjure himself for a third time. Right? Dude's already done two stints right. in Rikers, you know, for right. Trump. So, you know, what's another one? But no, they've decided to pin all their hopes on Robert Costello, who was being offered as an impeachment witness against Michael Cohen. And that's that's going to become significant in, in a second, right? Because Costello doesn't know anything about the deal, the Stormy Daniels contract and NDA and settlement agreement. So he is not a fact witness to the material events that give rise to this case. Mm-hmm. Instead, he's there to say Michael Cohen is now lying in on the basis of his testimony. And the way in which Trump's lawyers wanted that to happen was to say, I, Robert Costello, always represented Michael. Co- I was his lawyer. I was acting on his behalf. I never back channeled to Rudy or to Donald Trump. I, I, this I, is I, the I, dumbest plan. <laughs> It it really is. So, but but like, let me read you actual question asked on direct, which was question during your interactions with Michael Cohen. Did you, Robert Costello, consider him to be a client? Answer: Absolutely. Question: Whose interest did you have in mind? Answer: Exclusively Michael Cohen. I, I that that is that is just not credible testimony, Uh right? Right. Especially because there's all of these communications, the emails in the record of Costello saying to Cohen, like, the big guy in the White House really loves you. Giuliani says that you're doing great. And we're so appreciative of all that you've done. Like, that's if you're relaying messages from the White House that say, we love you and you're safe. That's no. Yeah, you're not representing Cohen. And, and those, I should point out, are documents that Costello willingly turned over to Jim Jordan and Congress. Right? Like it's, a, it's just baffling why you would choose this approach. And, and from a trial strategy perspective, what Trump's lawyers have done has essentially made their entire defense into, come on, who are you going to believe, Michael Cohen or Robert Costello? And, and look, like, that's the question. Like, I, the jury may vote Trump the death penalty, right? Like, is, Costello. Like, I don't think I, I don't think the jury would believe him if he testified that the sky was blue, right? I, it's it, wow. Yeah, I, I think it also undercuts another way that that Blanche uh, and Trump have tried to discredit Michael Cohen. They've asked him lots of questions on the witness stand about things that he has said publicly, comments that he has made publicly about this case. And they've mm. said they've complained bitterly about the gag order because they've said, why shouldn't Trump be able to attack witnesses in this case? Because, you know, when the witnesses can talk shit about him. And yet... Here they are featuring Costello, you know, hanging all their, putting all their chips on Bobby. And Robert Costello has been out there shit talking Cohen and talking about witnesses in this case and talking about the defendant in this case on TV and even in Congress in a deliberate attempt to launder this shit into the news cycle. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know. You will probably see Susan Hoffinger bring this up when she cross-examines Costello tomorrow. And I suspect you will see it in the closing arguments. But, okay, let's talk about the court's ruling as to what Costello could testify about. Justice Mershon mm-hmm. said, Mr. Bove, you can definitely cross-examine as to the two prior inconsistent statements. That is Michael Cohen's changing story about whether Trump knew about the payoff. And I will give you some latitude to offer some rebuttal as to the pressure campaign, that is to keep Cohen on side and not flipping in 2018. But I am not going to allow this to become a trial within a trial. Yeah, let, let me unpack that a little bit, right? So remember, Costello is not a fact witness, right? He doesn't know anything about anything that gave rise to the events for which Donald Trump is being tried. So he is being offered only as an impeachment witness, I- explicitly, right? That's what Trump's lawyers have said. New York Rule 6.11 says that you can introduce testimony to impeach if it is not, quote, collateral to the issues of the case. And so then the question before Justice Mershon was, Okay, right. Showing that Cohen changed his story uh, as a liar, right? That that's core. So 
illicit testimony on that. But like disputing whether Costello pressured Cohen to stay loyal to Trump, like that's collateral. So he's not going to let him get into it, right? That that's the trial within a trial part, right? Like, like this is not Michael Cohen's criminal trial. This is Donald Trump's because. Again, you know, remember sort of the overarching question, even even when you're not talking about an express motion about being unduly prejudicial, right? The question is, yeah, is that testimony going to confuse or distract or prejudice the jury? And Justice Mershon was like, no, Michael Cohen's not on trial here. Donald Trump is. But then he adds, I'm going to give you some leeway, right, to, to, you know, sort of do what you need to do. Right. And you can see that right off the bat when Bove was trying to elicit testimony on forbidden topics. He asked about Stormy Daniels. He asked about the NDA, right? All of this stuff, they objected. It's overruled. Did Trump's family come up? Yes. What did Cohen say about Trump's family? Objection. Sustained, right? Like you you can't testify if you're Costello about all of these things because they're totally irrelevant to to whether Trump knew. Yeah. And and so that left Bove with essentially trying to elicit testimony that Costello didn't know who Michael Cohen was until he tried to get him as a client, which was really weird, right? So Costello's like, yeah, I I didn't know Michael Cohen from a hole in the wall. Well, and I I think more to the point that Costello's theory of involvement in this case was that he was just like doing a favor for a friend and he didn't know Michael Cohen. And, you know, he, he had he had no feeling one way or the other. And then there was this email from his son that was like, wow, congratulations, you're going to get this really big client and it's going to lead to such great things for you. Like, yeah, no, you definitely wanted this client and you wanted him for a very specific reason, because it would connect you to Donald Trump. Right. If you're if you're Costello. (laughs) And then, you know, then that makes it even more clear that Costello wants to be a lawyer in Trump land. In fact, some of the reporters were speculating that this was kind of Costello's audition to be the next top Trump lawyer, you know, like a- apprentice style. Ooh. And I don't think that's crazy. Yeah, Although, yeah no, I did I, not I, perform all that well. Yeah. <laughs> no, he did not. And there's no follow up email from Costello back to his son saying, I don't understand why you're so impressed. Like, who's this Mike Clay Cohen that you're talking, right? Like, right. he knew who Michael Cohen was. He was Rudy's buddy. Like, no, that just was not credible. Yeah, and we've all been working up to this because it was just like absolute batshit. <laughs> Let, let's talk about yeah. Costello's conduct in the courtroom because he seemed really confused about who was in charge. Uh, I'm just going to read you a little excerpt. Obviously, as we said, there were all of these objections, right? So Bovey keeps asking him all of these questions designed to elicit answers which are outside the the court's remit, and they keep being sustained. And Costello is getting testier and testier, and he says, you know, geez, into the mic, and he says, what is going on here? And Mershon is like, what did you say? And Costello says, I shit you not, strike it. Uh, (laughs) Uh, Uh, Yeah. You do not, as a lawyer in a courtroom, start issuing rulings from counsel from the from the witness stand, let alone from yeah, counsel. Yeah, he's not a lawyer; he's a witness. No. Yeah. Right. So Mershon says, "Mr. Costello, I'd like to discuss proper decorum in my courtroom. As a witness on the stand, if you don't like my ruling, you don't say geez and you don't say strike it, because I'm the only one who can do that. And if you don't like my ruling, you don't give me side eye. And I believe that that was in the presence of the jury. It, it, it sure looks th- like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah." And then Costello kind of did something more obnoxious. And then Mershon cleared the courtroom, including including of the press. So I don't know what happened in there, <laughs> but it was not good. And like, I, look, the jury, if they already didn't think that Costello was a lying piece of shit, at least on par with Michael Cohen, they probably yeah. do now. Yeah, you can, you can tell. Like, here's the way I would say it. If every reporter live blogging this trial could say, wow, Justice Mershon hates Robert Costello, the jury noticed that too, right? <laughs> and and yeah. like, again, it sort of goes back to the fundamental strategy. And I, I, I think it might be possible. I, I don't know if you want to go double or nothing on calling Trump, but like, it might be possible that Trump's team puts another witness on just so they don't have to go to closing with the spectacle of like this being the guy that they put up there. And, and, and I, don't, I don't know. I sure would. I, I mean, do they have a plan? Have they had a plan? I True. have not seen any plan except for to like let Todd Blanche bore the jury to death and hope that, <laughs> you know, and hope that a witness screws something up. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I can't say I'm rooting for them. So uh, 
I was pleased. I was amused. We both had a good laugh following along today. And like you kept sending me escalating texts of like, oh my gosh, did you see this? <laughs> so, yeah. 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 All right. Let's just take one second before we say goodbye and say what we think is going to happen next. Right. So, okay. We have Costello is going to come back tomorrow. Tomorrow is Tuesday as we record this. That is also when those crazy motions are going to drop in Judge Cannon's court. So look for that. But in New York, Costello is going to testify. It does not appear that there will be any other witnesses. That is certainly what Beauvais and Blanche suggested today. So that's going to kind of be it. They will they will argue about other, other shit. Um, and then next week, we're looking at the end of this. We're looking at closing arguments next week, and then it will go to the jury. Yeah. And I should add really, really quickly, the thing we told you that Trump's lawyers would do, which is at the close of the prosecution's case in chief, immediately move for a directed verdict on the insufficiency of the evidence. They did not do that. As far as we can tell, they did not do that because at the end of the day, after the jury cleared out, after... Costello was a disaster on the stand and tried to usurp the judge's role and, you know, strike things from the record. Then Blanche got up in sidebar and said, we think there's, you know, not sufficient evidence and we would ask that you dismiss this case. And it's like, no, dude, like you're late. Like I I was stunned. I've never, ever mm -hmm. seen trial counsel fail to do so in, in a case. And I, I I don't have an explanation for it. I mean, look, it was going to get denied anyway, right? We, right we've been that, flagging yeah. that. But. I mean, it was going to... <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, that was very fun. And I am looking forward to whatever whack-assery comes out of that courtroom tomorrow. I will be watching together. <laughs> All right. We'll see you guys on Friday. Law and Chaos Podcast is a production of Raise It to Media LLC, is intended solely as entertainment, does not constitute legal advice, and does not form an attorney client relationship. This show is researched and written by Liz Dye and produced by Bryce Blake and Angle. Law and Chaos Pod, copyright 2024, Raise It to Media LLC, all rights reserved.